Hello, my name is Monica Reynolds. I'm an Azure specialist, and today we're going to talk about best practices for setting up Azure subscriptions, as well as best practices for adding users to those subscriptions. One of the first questions you're going to have is how many subscriptions should I have and what services should be grouped together in those subscriptions? So when it comes to the subscription space, less tends to be more in Azure. Some big cons of having a single subscription or much fewer subscriptions is it's just much easier to control. You can deploy different sort of projects into resource groups, resource groups being uh, similar services that have the same life cycle. So you want to deploy them all at the same time. With one click, you want to deactivate them all at the same time. You can group those resources very easily in that sense and then give folks very specific role-based access to just those groups that you want them to be working with the services in. So centralized operations and control becomes much easier in a single subscription. You can also reuse a lot of the services you've already set up. So if you need a VPN gateway to connect back on premise for a hybrid environment, then you might want to put more of your items into the same subscription so they can use that VPN gateway much easier. A couple of cons of this, uh, pretty you know, standard here, is you might hit some limit constraints. So Azure subscriptions can have a certain amount of capacity. That capacity is very large, and I'll show you what that capacity is, but there are some constraints there. Um, the other thing to think about is that you must have much granular role-based access. So in allowing folks access to your subscription, you want to make sure that you're giving them the appropriate rights so that somebody who shouldn't be messing with your networking is going in and doing so, or if somebody shouldn't be able to spin up additional services, delete services, or shouldn't have read access rights does not have that to your subscription. So some of the limits and capacities to think about here, uh, this just gives you a very short list uh, of some to think about, but there's a very long list here linked at the bottom that you can go look up. And it gets very detailed of what the capacity limits of our networking, storage, compute, and everything is. Um, but as you can see, these subscriptions have a lot of capacity. For a VM, you can have 10,000 VMs running in the same region. You can have 250 storage accounts. A storage account is not 250 gigs or terabytes, a single storage account can hold up to 500 terabytes. So you can have up to 250 storage accounts, each containing 500 terabytes apiece. Resource groups, like we mentioned before, that can be associated to projects. You can have eight, 800 separate ones of those in your subscription. And then you can see some of the other capacity constraints here. So multiple subscriptions is something to really think about because to some extent, Every single one of you is going to have multiple subscriptions. Uh, probably a lot of you watching this video already have deployed multiple subscriptions. So let's start thinking about maybe we should consolidate some of these or how do I start managing these better um, as I go down this process. And we'll talk about that in a couple slides here too. But some of the pros of multiple subscriptions is you don't hit any of those capacity constraints. If you have a research group at your university that wants to spin up a ton of Hadoop clusters and do some really big petabyte of data computing, you probably want them to be in their own subscription space. It's also much easier to deploy different projects. Um, if you have a lot of people in a subscription and you've got a networking team in there that's supposed to be doing all the networking for every kind of project that's going on, it might be more difficult to get things moving on the timeline that you need it to if you're relying on a bunch of different groups managing different parts of the process of the workloads that need to be deployed. So if you're, if you're in your own subscription, you have much more uh, full management control of what's being spun up in there and could probably move your project along a little little bit more quickly and have a little bit more agility there. Now, some of the cons you will run into, like we mentioned before, is that there is going to be more increased management. You, you know, for the VPN gateway example we brought up earlier, if you need to connect back on-prem, each subscription would need its own connection because these are isolated subscriptions. Uh, you would have to have a, a VPN gateway in your second subscriptions just as you would in your first subscription. Now there are some updates there though that we are doing to make this easier, such as VNet peering. Um, so we'll talk about that and how you can use that, but just some things to think about in terms of that hybrid connection, especially if these are supposed to be hybrid subscriptions. So use this slide sort of as your guide um, or sort of checklist 
to think about as you're deciding what should be put into the same subscription. So if you think about your business requirements, uh, performance, uh, we talked about Express Route work quickly. That's a, a dedicated private connection into our direct connection into Azure. And so if you have one or two or three projects that require uh, an Express Route connection, it's probably a good idea to group them together in the same subscription. Technical requirements, you see uh, dedicated shared network connectivity that we just mentioned, AD requirements. Um, some of the other requirements you might see are around, um, you know, just what the services are themselves. So for instance, backup and disaster recovery use the same recovery services vault. So you might want to group those two into the same subscription space since they're going to use that same vault. Uh, another one here is security requirements. So we kind of talked about that before. How many people do you want to give access? Who should have access? And making sure, um, especially in your production, most critical application uh, subscription, the subscription running your most critical applications, make sure you probably have fewer people accessing that or can make changes to that. And then finally, the, the scalability that we mentioned before. How much, how much capacity do you need? Is there going to be any growth pains? Uh, how many additional users? Just some of the last sort of thoughts there. Now, in terms of a, a real world design, so I'm just going to whiteboard this out for you a little bit because I get this question a lot. What are folks like me doing uh, same size school districts or universities? So if you're a more centralized school district or university or you have a, you know, a smaller footprint, you might have something very, very simple. You'll have your enterprise agreement. That's your agreement for your Azure subscriptions and departments and everything you have going on in Azure. And you might actually just have two subscriptions, sub one and sub two. And that's it. You don't have any departments. You don't have any of those extra overheads. You just have two subscriptions. And this might be for your production environment. And this one might be for a dev test, for example, or maybe a, a side project from a, a marketing group or, or whatnot. Um, so this is really just the basics of what you might do. Um, now, let's say, for instance, uh, your curriculum group wants to live stream graduation. And really, this, this has only been IT working in your spaces right here. Well, instead of spinning them up a separate subscription, you might just use the role-based access that we mentioned before and give them a resource group within your production subscription and give them access only to that resource group. So you could spin up all the services in this resource group related to media services for their live streaming. Give them access to just that resource group and then when their project is over you can deactivate those services and they no longer have access to your subscription um, from the entire time though they've never had access to anything outside of that resource group so it's a very easy centralized way uh, to look at this now if you're a much more uh, complex uh, decentralized or large-scale university it's going to get a lot more complicated than that really quickly so if you think about some of the things that I see very often, you'll have your enterprise agreement, and this might be your main agreement. This is the one that Central IT is working out of. But what you'll quickly find, and maybe you didn't know ahead of time, or you planned for this, um, you actually have a couple other enterprise agreements here. And this might be from a different campus that set this up. So maybe you know the main agreement's on campus A, there's a second agreement in campus B, and, and then maybe actually a, a separate group set up their own own enrollment. Um, this might be your medical school. Uh, I've seen it as research groups. I've seen it as auxiliary, whatever it might be. They might be separate here as well. So you'll have multiple enrollments that you're already dealing with. And within your main enrollment, you'll have a couple departments here. IT might actually be set up as a department. You might have your business school or your economic school or whatever it might be that is using the school of dentistry they might have their actual own department and are managing their subscriptions themselves from there you might also have um, you know another department here that could be a, a research group or a specific project uh, that you're working on and then they too have their own subs that they're managing and they're dealing with and IT itself might even have multiple subscriptions. I've seen it where they might have um, multiple sub IT groups that are a little bit more isolated or separated that are working in their own spaces uh, here as well. So and then if you think about what these enterprise agreements are doing with multiple departments and subs, we start to get very large very quickly. 
So if you're trying to think about how do I start centrally managing this and start putting some best practices around here, uh, a really easy way to do that to start sharing resources um, is through VNet peering. So this is something that went GA uh, very recently. But basically what you can now do is if I set up a VPN connection, VPN gateway in this subscription here, and if I have one networking team that really would be the one that's managing my networking across maybe all of these subscriptions or maybe also these other enrollments here, I can set up a VNet peering so that this subscription is now peering with this subscription and then use this one to pair with this one and, and so forth so that even though this one has the VPN gateway, these subscriptions can get access to it. Or even this subscription and this other enrollment could also get access. So that's the, one of the ways that um, you could start sharing resources, especially if you already have an isolated environment with multiple subscriptions. Now there are a couple of requirements here to think about. These resources in these subscriptions must be in the same Azure region. So they must all be in West US or South Central US. So you can set up multiple connections and do VNet peering that way. If this one is, if this uh, subscription here is peered with this subscription, you can still have a separate VPN gateway set up here. Um, so just something to think about as long as they're in the same region and a, a region, and as long as you don't have overlapping IP addresses, this will work. Now, the other thing to note here, it's not a transitive relationship. So even though VNet A, if this is A, is pairing with B, and B is now pairing with C, that does not mean A is pairing with C. So just keep that in mind as you're looking at this. Now we've mentioned resource groups a couple times, so just a refresher. This, what we mean when we say resource groups is we're really talking about a container that holds multiple resources you've deployed, multiple compute, storage, networking, whatever it might be, uh, for an application or a project that have the same life cycle. So you're deploying it together, you're updating it together, or you're deleting it together. A great example of this might be deploying ADFS or migrating ADFS into Azure. You would basically uh, set up your VMs, your DCs, your networking, everything there, you can deploy it as a resource group. So since that represents your entire ADFS infrastructure, you can deploy it as a group. So that's all grouped together up in Azure. Now it's a great way to also limit the access and control someone might have to your resources. Because if let's say my Office 365 folks need access to my ADFS infrastructure, I can do so without giving them access to my disaster recovery or my backup or, or whatnot. So you can really then give the right folks access to your different resources without giving them necessarily the keys to the kingdom and everything you have deployed in the cloud. And the last thing that makes this really, really interesting is being able to now deploy things with templates. So what we're talking about is JSON templates, if you're familiar with those. So my counterpart, Eric, has a video series that you can see from the same uh, YouTube channel on, for Azure. And it's about deploying actually a JSON template of an ADFS infrastructure. So just as we mentioned, you know, deploying it as a resource group within less than three minutes, he can deploy everything related to your load balancing subnets for your networking, your domain controllers and VMs, everything, and deploys it as this resource group and everything is up and running in less than three minutes. So it becomes really powerful as you start to look at uh, very specific workloads and migrating those to the cloud. So when looking at resource groups, uh, we keep talking about role-based access. And the way we're doing that is we are tying your Active Directory um, to Azure AD and bringing Azure AD uh, into your Azure environment. So if you have Office 365 deployed today, the, the base or the back end of that is Azure Active Directory. You have a uh, formulary called DirSync, now it's uh, AD Connect, connected to your um, on-premise or wherever you're Active Directory is uh, to Azure, and then that is allowing um, us to be able to sync your uh, directory. So that um, can be given access. So we can bring that in and give access to a user. Um, and we can do um, quite a few different user roles here. So there's 40 different types of roles that you could bring in uh, to the Azure space and give them rights to your subscription. Um, and if there's not a role there that you see that you want, you can create a custom role. 
Uh, you also have access to any change history. Um, so if somebody did have access uh, and made some changes and then they no longer have access, that history is still available, uh, especially for reporting purposes. So connecting your AD to role-based access, uh, we're going to talk about that, um, and I'll show that in another video demo that's on this series. Uh, but just to give you an idea of some of those most popular roles, um, it's uh, owner, contributor, and reader are probably the first three you're going to think about. So an owner not only has full access to all the resources in the subscription, they also have the right to dig delegate what others have access to. So if I want to give my networking team uh, networking contributor rights to my subscription, an owner is somebody that can do that. Now a contributor is somebody that can contribute to services all up in the subscription, but they cannot grant access to others and they can also not delete themselves. So if they wanted to um, actually remove themselves, an owner must be the one to remove them. And then a reader is somebody that can view the resources that are existing in Azure, but they cannot make any changes. So I put some of the steps here below on how to do this, but I'll also have a demo of that in another video.